good morning everyone uh, welcome to the uh, presentation on how to master uh, ecs optimization using autonomous techniques with me uh, today i have two amazing technologies technologists nate singletary from now before he's a senior site reliability engineer from the platform team welcome nate and uh, we have meenakshi uh, who's a staff engineer uh, leading the ecs track in sadai she's online with us welcome meenakshi Okay. Okay. As a structure for our next 20 minutes, uh, we'll go through an overview on ECS, uh, we'll go through some of the challenges, uh, what are some of the optimization challenges, how do organizations look at it, uh, Minakshi will walk through the autonomous solution and Nate will finally walk us through how they did it in Novifor. <clears throat> okay, let's start with some overview on ECS. Uh, to set context, uh, I wanted to uh, start with how Amazon has organized uh, compute models. So uh, they have a shared model. They, Amazon does a lot of things for you as a cloud service provider. And they expect, as you, who is the user, to do certain things. So at the far right, uh, you have EC2, which is uh, most flexible. Uh, so Amazon gives you a lot of features. You, know, you can provision VMs fast. You can plug it into a network fast. But you are expected to do uh, patching, you are expected to wire to the right uh, load balancer, stuff like that. Right? So EC2 is the most uh, flexible, but it needs management. Then comes ECS and EKS. Uh, ECS is Amazon's own native container orchestration platform. Um, so um, you have multiple ways to run ECS. Uh, you can run ECS on EC2 backed clusters, or uh, you could run ECS on a serverless container cluster. Uh, which is kind of a modern way to do stuff right now. So uh, ECS and EKS. Uh, EKS is the Kubernetes managed service from Amazon. <clears throat> then Amazon gives you Fargate. ECS can be implemented on Fargate. Um, so Fargate is how you run containers in more of a serverless fashion. And then the uh, one that requires least management is AWS Lambda. Uh, so serverless. Uh, but if you look across all these compute models, uh, they all expect development teams to still do a few things. You know, what version of code are you deploying? You know, what's your compute profile? What's your uh, horizontal compute profile? You know, how much, how, how does your application react to uh, different seasonalities? So there are a lot of uh, challenges that app teams need to do uh, when they manage. Okay, let's jump into ECS, which is our focus today. <clears throat> now, to explain ECS, ECS has three layers. Uh, there's a scheduler. Uh, which is fully managed by Amazon. That's the container scheduler. That's the controller. And then uh, AWS gives you different ways to provision ECS clusters. You know, you could do it from a command line interface. You could write your own IAC templates. Uh, you know, you could do CDK. You could use Terraform. There are different ways you could uh, provision and manage ECS clusters. And at the bottom, um, AWS gives you different capacity options. You could run ECS on Fargate. You could run ECS on EC2 backed instances. And recently, they've introduced uh, Outpost, which is you could run your ECS clusters on your data centers or you know, anywhere you want, uh, which is amazing. Uh, moving forward. Um, and how is ECS structured, right? The compute equivalent in ECS is a task. So typically, if you have applications, you define tasks. And each task can have one or more containers. Typically, you will have an app container. You may have a agent or a logging agent running with it, or you might run um, containers as a, you know, a single container applications. They're all deployed as services, uh, which can be horizontally scaled. And um, if it's a cluster, you will deploy it on a cluster. If it's Fargate, um, you'll use Fargate. Awesome. Um, just to give you a glimpse of how big is ECS. ECS is widely used, as in widely used. Uh, if you look at the numbers, there are over 2.25 billion with a B containers spot every week. And this was announced in an Amazon reinvent uh, last year. 2.25 billion containers. We use ECS back services as end user customers. You know, a lot of video streaming providers. Amazon.com itself uses ECS. Yeah. And some of the numbers, tens of thousands of API requests per second served by ECS. You know, globally present, 30 plus regions. So that's kind of the scale of how ECS is being used. <clears throat> Let's jump into some of the challenges uh, that you have in ECS. Now, uh, this is a report, uh, Datadog 
every year uh, they create a report uh, around container usages. So this is the recent report, number 2023. What they say here is 65% of containers based at least 50% of CPU and memory. That means half of containers are being wasted. So if I go back to my two point odd billion containers, almost a billion containers worth of compute resources are wasted according to the report from Datadog. And we have pulled out similar reports from um, other API providers, which will be, which uh, some of the other presentations have. Uh, but this is a staggering number, you know, most of them based at least 50% of CPU and memory. So that's kind of a problem that the industry has, you know, everybody over provisions uh, their computes. Why do they do that? Because number one, they don't know what to provision for. So they just over provision. Okay, let me put double the capacity or three times the capacity so that things are okay when I hit my seasonality peaks and my you know, you know special use cases. Uh, so that's kind of an, a, a bigger uh, problem there, right? So nobody knows, um, engineering teams focus on releasing features. They're not focused on what runs in production. So they just keep it safe, you know, build standard and build uh, all provision stuff. So when this happens, there are multiple levers that you could, Amazon actually is giving you different levers to optimize your uh, costs and, you know, optimize for performance. You can uh, right size your services. Uh, you can, you know, vertically size it or you can horizontally size it. You can adjust your cluster by managing a container instances if you use a EC2 back cluster. Um, you could use the purchasing commitments that Amazon has given you. There are savings plans, RI, multiple options. And then um, there is the opportunity to use spot instances where it's appropriate, you know, fault tolerant uh, use case. Even in product, sometimes if it's fault tolerant, you could use spot. Mostly in development, pre-prod environments, you would want to use spot because you know, even if it's environment is down for a few minutes, you're okay. So these are all the levers that you have. I mean, actually, and Nate will go through some of the details there. Um, and even though you have all these levers, how do you know what to adjust? Um, so each application have a lot of inputs. It has its uh, traffic that's inbound. Uh, traffic has its seasonality. Applications are released almost every day, sometimes multiple times a day. So you have that complexity there. And what do you look for? You look for metrics. Uh, you look for CPU. You look for memory. You look for you know, performance. So you have all these complex combinations to look for, uh, even to optimize one application. Think about thousands of applications that you're managing. The complexity kind of grows significantly. And so the number that I put there, most organizations will have not hundreds, thousands of microservices. So to manage 100 microservices that are released at least once a week, if you look at the uh, numbers out there, uh, average of six performance metrics, multiple traffic patterns, four releases a month, you are looking at 7,200 combinations of metrics to analyze. And that's only for 100 microservices. Think about 2,000 microservices. That's a staggering number. So that's kind of the complexity that you deal with when you want to optimize things almost every day. Uh, it's kind of humanely impossible uh, to manage a big fleet and optimize it all the time. So that's kind of the challenges and the complexity around how to optimize. So I kind of did the easy part. I threw all the problems out there. I explained ECS. Now Meenakshi and Nate will go through the hard part. They'll uh, explain how to solve these challenges. So uh, Meenakshi, to you. Thank you, Benji. So before we dive uh, deeper into ECS optimization, let us consider the benefits of having an autonomous system. So having an autonomous system is like having your own SRE buddy who helps you manage your production environments, and it does so in a safe and hassle-free manner. Next slide, please. And uh, it detects problems. It figures out the solution, validates it. And most importantly, it safely executes these actions in production as well. Next slide, please. So uh, with automation, we can see that there are a lot of challenges because it involves a lot of manual configuration. You have to manually set the threshold, come up with the metric that you need to monitor and things like that. But uh, with an autonomous system, it studies the behavior of the application and it adapts accordingly. Next slide, please. Uh, so when we talk about uh, optimizing a service, what is it that we really care about? 
uh, are we looking to improve performance? Do we want to improve cost? And so all we have to do is uh, let the system know of these goals and then sit back and let the system work its magic. Next slide, please. Uh, so let us look at the various ways through which we can optimize ECS services. So performing these actions in the right order is the key to ensuring that we can run these services as optimized as possible uh, from both in the uh, perspective of cost and performance. So the first one is, uh, sorry, can we uh, go back to the previous one? Thank you. So the first one is uh, service optimization. And with service optimization, it is about right-sizing your uh, compute, finding the right uh, CPU or memory configuration. The second one is a container instance optimization. And here we fi figure out what is the best uh, instance type that suits your application. The next one is purchasing options. So AWS offers steep discounts of up to 72% when you uh, commit to a certain amount of usage. So there are various options available like uh, compute savings plans, instant savings plans with varying levels of flexibility when uh, whether you want to change the uh, region or instance type or tenancy after you have purchased these. And the discounts vary uh, for all of these. And the next one is spot instances. So spot is basically AWS's unused capacity that they let us use for up to 90% uh, discount. So the catch with uh, spot is that they can be reclaimed at any time. So uh, it is suitable only for fault tolerant and uh, stateless non-critical workloads. Uh, if you have like a bad service that runs a uh, few times a day, uh, does certain computations, it's probably an ideal candidate for Spot. Uh, so Sedai looks at all these options and comes up with the ideal combination to give you the maximum savings. Next slide, please. So the first one uh, is right-sizing your ECS services. So ideally, we have to come up with the best possible configuration, which is... Uh, for your CPU memory and your task count. So we have to consider a lot of factors like uh, the application releases, the traffic that it encounters. And how Sedai does it is it looks at the metrics like CPU, memory, and traffic over a long period of time and comes up with this ideal configuration. Sedai is aware of the application behavior and learns the traffic patterns. So through reinforcement learning, it keeps fine tuning this configuration and validates it and modifies it after every release. So in this example, we can see that we have uh, reduced the CPU, increased the memory, and decreased the task count as well. So with just this right sizing, we were able to achieve uh, uh, achieve cost savings of 43%, and it also ran faster. Uh, next slide, please. So with right sizing, we have to keep in mind that uh, we have to do it with respect to typical traffic. So if we want to handle the peak traffic, we'll have to uh, use service autoscaling, uh, autoscaling in general. So autoscaling can be done at uh, two levels, which is the cluster level and the service level. So cluster level is basically dynamically adjusting your uh, container instance count, and service autoscaling is uh, adjusting the task count. So by adding autoscalers to your service, uh, you can increase its availability and it enables the services to handle requests even during peak traffic. So the benefits are both from the perspective of cost as well as performance, because now you don't have to provision for peak traffic, so you save costs. And because it autoscales, uh, it handles uh, peak traffic as well without any performance degradation. So when configuring autoscalers, we need to look at the metric that we need to scale against and the threshold associated with it. So Sedai figures out this uh, metric by looking into your application, whether it's CPU bound or memory bound, and we come up with the metrics. So the metrics that can be used include uh, CPU, memory, request count, or even custom application metrics like queue size. So in the example, we see that uh, we are using a C5 X large instance. There are eight instances, so it's provisioned for peak traffic. and after optimization or after adding uh, autoscaler associated with it, we see that we decreased uh, the amount of instances needed for typical traffic. The desired count is four and the max count is eight. So it can scale up to eight instances when needed to handle the requests. 
Um, next slide, please. So another challenge with respect to uh, saving costs in ECS are the dev and the pre-prod clusters. So these don't need to be running all the time uh, because they're not used all the time. So they can be scaled down when they are not in use. So to do this, we can adopt schedules. So uh, Sedai does this autonomously as well. And another option is to use spot instances. So uh, by taking into consideration certain factors like startup time, the nature of the application, whether it's stateful or stateless, uh, Sedai identifies if a service can be run on spot. And by doing so, we can uh, leverage the discounts that AWS offers. So it's useful for uh, fault tolerant and uh, non-critical stateless workloads. Next slide, please. So in this example, we can see that uh, we have decreased the memory from 10 GB to 4 GB and the CPU from 4 to 2. And just by this right sizing, we were able to achieve a cost saving of about 52%. And if we move this service uh, into a spot instance as well, we'll be able to achieve an additional 28% on top of this. So by right-sizing your instance, adding autoscalers, and considering spot, you can ensure that your ECS services are always running at the maximum poss possible savings. Now, after performing all these steps, Sedai doesn't just leave it at this configuration, it continuously optimizes the service to ensure that it's always aligned with the goal that you have set. Next slide, please. So to talk about uh, Nubufo's autonomous ECS journey, we have Nate Singletary from Nubufo's platform engineering team. Over to you, Nate. We're in the platform engineering division. I want to talk about our journey with autonomous ECS. So a little bit about Know Before. We're the provider of the world's largest uh, security awareness training and simulated phishing platform. Uh, we're used by over 34,000 organizations globally. And we have the world's largest library of security awareness training content. We're also a great place to work. Um, some of our accolades in 2023 are engaged. We were ranked number one in Intergage's top workplaces in the USA, number one in Tampa Bay Times top workplaces, and ranked among the best workplaces for women in the UK. We have a diverse suite of products ranging from our security awareness tools to our security our training platform, our content modules, security orchestration tools, human detection response that can provide real time, can integrate with your security stack to provide real-time coaching to your users in response to risky behavior. All these products are spread across thousands of microservices, functions, and data stores, and it's all deployed in AWS across several compute and data storage services. So our, our platform architecture is pretty straightforward. We, we deploy, we commit all our code in GitLab, all of our CI CD runs in, on, in GitLab on GitLab runners. Our, our production workloads are deployed in AWS, and all of our monitoring metrics and alerting is in Datadog. Um, other than a few missing from this slide, we don't have a ton of vendors. So when we onboard new vendors, it's kind of a big deal for us. But we did see a need in this kind of void post the you know, commit, deploy, and monitoring workflow. Um, so we have ECS services running in AWS and we wanna ensure they're running efficiently. How do we know if they are, or, and, if, and if they're not, how do we react to that? How do we fix it? Well, today, before, well, before Sedai, as an engineer kind of fills that void, they have to respond to the feedback from the monitoring, you know, whether it's, you know, metrics alerting, so maybe a service is running too low a memory, too, too, too low CPU, and it's, it's peaking and we're seeing performance issues or, we're running too rich and and service we're missing out on maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars of cost savings across several services um, so how do we fix it an engineer has to commit some code to update that config deploy it and then wait wait for that feedback see if we've right sized correctly and this is a continuous process across you know, several services, thousands of microservices and functions. 
Um, that's kind of where Sadai fit that, that void for us. It allows us to reduce the toil on that engineer and autonomize that feedback loop. So autonomous initiative drivers, again, we want to reduce toil on our engineers, allow them to focus on the things they like to do, releasing new products and features. And we also want to make sure our workloads are running efficiently. It means keep the velocity, keep releases coming, but keep costs at the front of our minds while also ensuring our services are performant. And how do we do that? We run our we're containerized workloads in ECS Fargate. We don't worry about managing the cluster or the underlying host. And then we allow us to die to autonomously uh, right size our, our services and adjust our auto scaling. So how we adopted autonomous, uh, we I know before we took a three part approach of crawl, walk, run. On the first part in crawl, we set the initial Sadai integration up. We set up an initial goal of maybe 10% cost reduction. Um, it just gives us an ability to allow Sadai to analyze the workloads, see where we're maybe over provision, you know, what opportunities for cost reduction or performance gains we have. And then we enable autonomous on a set of services. Now we're not diving off the deep end in, in this stage. We're just, this is, these are low risk services. We, want to just, we just wanna see how services react to the autonomous optimizations. And the walk stage, we, we've now seen you know, some, some, some evaluation. We've seen some opportunities for significant cost reduction, significant performance gains. And we've also seen some realized cost reduction and performance gains in the set of low risk services that we've enabled. Um, so we're like, okay, this autonomous thing is kind of cool. We, you know, we're, we're ready, ready to get a little crazy. We'll turn this on for our, you know, our flagship products. So before we do that, we create groups and we divide these groups up by products and regions and set goals depend, um, that tailored, are tailored to the products. So we may have a, a product that has services that are more latency tolerant and we have a more aggressive cost reduction goal. So we'll set that goal for that particular group versus another group that we may want to reduce costs, but we, we need to maintain the highest levels of availability and performance. So we're not as aggressive there. And so and then we turn on autonomous optimization for them. So in the, in the next phase is run where it's kind of, we've hit the Sadai take the wheel moment. It's it, services are uh, autonomous, services are autonomous optimized. It's no longer an opt-in or it's no longer an opt-in, it's opt-out. If you release a service in ECS, it's automatically managed by Sadai. It's integrated across all our AWS accounts and it's managing services across all of our regions. And then we're working towards integrating Sadai back into that CI CD flow. So we have that full autonomized feedback loop. So you see now, now Sadai has filled that, that void for us. So here's an example of the opportunities we've seen in Sadai. Um, it's projecting a 20%, 27% cost savings. So we're four hundred thousand dollars in cloud spend. That's a pretty significant reduction in our cost. And this is across all of our clusters and accounts. So I'll go ahead and I'm not sure I am on time, but I'll go ahead and so this is another example of some of the realized savings. These are some of the Lambda services we reduce cost, but also, you know, reduce duration, increase performance in these in these services. So some highlights from our journey um, of the 90, just just under 9,500 9, services in autonomous that we are uh, services in Sadia that we have, we're at 98% auto autonomous optimization. We have we've had over 1100 uh, uh, autonomous actions in three months. We're projecting again, 27% cost reduction. And we've already achieved 10% of that. Um, and then we're, like I said, we're in the progress of integrating that back into our CI CD processes. So we have that full autonomized flow workflow. Um, and then the IAC rem remains the source of truth for our configs. So that's a, uh, that was our journey at no before. One, one, one uh, question. Um, do you run stateful workloads in ECS and how's your experience so far? 
Uh, we we do run stateful workloads. Um, a lot of our a lot of our workloads are ECS, lots of ECS working containers. We run Sidekick in ECS. Um, we have queues of jobs that they're continuously processing. Um, but we have also moved our jobs to to Lambda um, to take advantage of a lot of the optimizations available um, in Zadai. So right sizing our workloads, job a job for a for one queue, an email queue, an email notification queue may not need the same size Lambda or size ECS container for another job. That's just uh, a cron, a cron worker or something running in the background or, or late at night. Okay. I, uh, a second question. Uh, how do you get all the performance metrics for ECS? Is that like CloudWatch or, or another service? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I, we, okay. So yeah, we, we yeah we have cloud metrics, but we export all of like I said, we all of our monitoring is based in Datadog. So we export logs, and metrics into Datadog, and have alerting um, enabled to there. Okay. And uh, the last question we had here: uh, Are there other AWS services you would want to optimize beyond compute? No, probably database storage, maybe. Mm -hmm. Any particular database store, storage services you, you're using in your stack? Uh, our, well, we're using RDS, um, a lot of Dynamo. So some optimizations around our data storage would be pretty cool. Got it. Great. Okay. Uh, thanks. Yep. Thanks so much. Cheers.